Uh, thank you, Linda. I did have to jog down to make sure I got here as close to time as possible. Um, we do try to squeeze a lot of, uh, a lot of things in. Um, for those people who don't uh, know me, my name is Stuart Ayres. I am the Minister for Trade, Tourism, Major Events and the Minister for Sport in New South Wales. Uh, I'm a uh, resident of a little village called Mulgoa, but when I first moved to Sydney, I lived in Glenbrook. So I can very much say that uh, the Blue Mountains is not only just part of my electorate, but it's very much part of my life. Um, and before I got elected, I actually worked at a private higher education provider. So listening to Quality Assurance and Texa and moving of uh, organi or one group of students from one curriculum to the next and all of the work that's attached to that, I have a very, very strong appreciation for the work that's been done uh, throughout uh, uh, the work that, that Laureate have done since their significant investment into, uh, into Australia and I do want to commend you publicly on that. I think it's fantastic to have uh, more higher education opportunities for Australians and also for those people who choose to come to Australia to study and international students are right at the forefront of both our, our trade and international engagement opportunities. I also wanted to thank uh, Edith for her wonderful welcome to country and also recognise uh, the Indigenous uh, custodians of the land on which we meet today and say, as I regularly do these days, that we need to move from recognising Indigenous Australians at the beginning of functions and make sure that we finally recognise them in the Australian Constitution. It's a pretty simple thing to do. Um, <laughs> look, I, I know I have uh, the opportunity just to give some welcome and opening remarks bef uh, before your conference over the next couple of days. First thing I wanted to say, as any good tourism minister should say, is thank you for coming to Sydney uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy your time. You'll find a number of wonderful activities and events and product uh, for you to be able to absorb in amongst all of your learnings. Um, here in New South Wales, we do pride ourselves on a very, very strong and dynamic tourism market. Uh, we're the number one state when it comes to tourism activity. Now, that's a bit of a, a boast, um, but it's one we should be able to maintain. We're a gateway city. Uh, we have uh, more international tourists visiting New South Wales uh, than any other state across the country. In fact, international visitation uh, in New South Wales was over 3.3 million last year, uh, and that continues to underpin a very, very strong domestic market as well. In fact, New South Wales received overall 31 million overnight visitors over the last 12 months, both domestic and international, and they stayed over 172 million nights uh, and generated over $24 billion in visitor expenditure. So we're talking about significant business. It's the second largest uh, service export that New South Wales has uh, alongside international students. So the combination of uh, education that you're gathering here today as well as tourism uh, really is the dynamic and strongest component of our international trade offering out of this state. And I think you will find very, very similar figures when it comes to service exports right across the country. Uh, New South Wales remains a destination of choice, attracting more domestic visitors, nights and expenditure than any other state. Uh, New South Wales received 8.1 million domestic visitors, um, more domestic visitors than Queensland and 6.6 .6 million more domestic visitors than Victoria in the last year, continuing to underpin our very, very strong position. I do think, um, given the flavour of this conference, that it's important to recognise a lot of the work that we are doing in New South Wales to attract and encourage visitors from new markets. About four and a half years ago after my government was first formed, we created Destination New South Wales, which was a merging of the Tourism New South Wales and Events New South Wales bodies to create one cohesive and very, very strong marketing agency to promote New South Wales across the globe. We work very, very closely with our federal counterparts uh, at Tourism Australia, but we also have an incredibly strong presence right across uh, our target markets, particularly New Zealand, uh, United States, Europe, uh, where we're seeing really strong strength and growth out of Germany as an interesting market. Uh, but what we're also seeing is incredibly strong growth out of Asia, and particularly North Asia. We're seeing a return of uh, strong growth out of Japan, and Korea continues to be strong. And China, over the last two years, has now become the number one source destination for international tourists to New South Wales. And that figure, I think, will largely become a consistent figure across the rest of the country. Uh, in the last 12 months to September, we generated over 536,000 visitors uh, from China, showing just how important that growth market is. 
Um, India is a, another market that we often think about more from a trade perspective that's growing, but it's also growing from a tourism perspective. It's now moved into the top 10 as far as source markets for international uh, visitors coming to New South Wales, and my expectation is that will continue to grow, particularly as we work on stronger partnerships with providers and operators out of India, and that includes airline partnerships, which I think is something that underpins a significant amount of growth uh, and also presents a challenge for New South Wales, given that we operate a constrained, uh, an artificially constrained airport. Um, and no matter what we do with relation to the development of new airports, quite frankly, closer to your school at Badgerys Creek, um, we, we will always find over the next 10 years that we'll be battling some of those constraints. Uh, some of the figures are, are, are quite significant. Uh, growth rates for flights and seats landing at Melbourne Airport over the last five years have jumped, uh, in some cases, across seats and flights themselves in the order of 30%. Uh, in New South Wales, we're, we're lucky to, to be able to break 6% in growth, and that's largely because we, can, we run a curfewed airport. Now, the big challenge around the curfewed airport uh, and interactions with growth markets is not the curfew in Sydney, but it actually is about the capacity to restrict takeoff times in any airport around the world. Uh, we don't live on a flat globe and not everyone lives in exactly the same time zone. So if you decide to close your airport down for seven hours a day, you're actually closing a window of seven hours at any other given location around the globe. Now, there's the competition for slots at airports is, is incredibly uh, strong. There are only 80 slots an hour at Sydney International Airport, and if you decide that we can't open those up to any larger than 80, uh, you restrict uh, the, the operating time of that airport to reduce it by seven hours in any 24-hour period, you're going to have a significant impact on the amount of people that can actually access your city. And so we do need to be conscious of that. It's also I think the fundamental reason why there's an economic argument for a new airport at Badgerys Creek, and I do think that it also opens up fantastic opportunities across Western Sydney. We've done a lot of work uh, in opening up our international markets with strong representatives for New South Wales across a lot of those key markets, and we've also, outside of our top 10 markets, identified Indonesia as a potential, uh, uh, as a potential top market, and we're paying very, very close attention to the growth that's happening across that particular community, and also the, the, the strength that exists across the middle class. And I think that's the message that's coming out of Asia, is that the burgeoning and growing middle class is becoming much more global, much more savvy, uh, and they want to be able to purchase uh, tourism opportunities the same as any other dynamic middle class across the rest of the globe. To that extent, Destination New South Wales has uh, looked to create partnerships, whereas we've spent a lot of time focused on uh, airline partnerships, making sure that we operate at a very, very strong tactical level and allow Tourism Australia to continue to function at their more macro and strategic branding position. Whereas what we're focused on is literally bums on seats and bed nights and visitor expenditure. I don't make any apology for that. I've got limited resources compared to a, a Commonwealth budget and I want to make sure that any partnerships that I do create are ones that are commercially beneficial to both the public in New South Wales through visitor expenditure and also the commercial viability of those tourism operators. So um, to that effect, we've also looked at new models of engagement. Uh, we've formed one of the very first international partnerships with SeaTrip, which is one of the largest online booking agencies out of China. Uh, if you don't mind, they've got about 200 million registered users. It's not a bad database to be able to uh, run a direct email marketing campaign or run direct marketing campaigns with uh, tourism providers across New South Wales. But it shows uh, that we have to be able to broaden uh, beyond traditional selling techniques to be able to tap into uh, internet technology and particularly large booking agencies that are operating across IT platforms. I think what will be a, really, a very relevant topic of conversation over the course of the next few days is also the skills that are required um, to make sure that we provide the most hospitable and uh, best quality of service to those uh, new and emerging markets. There's a lot of discussion across the tourism sector about being China ready. Uh, I think it's about being China aware, but really being Asia ready. The diversity of communities that are traveling, whether they be Singaporean, Malaysian, uh, Indonesia, 
um, re-emergence of Japan getting back really strongly into the tourism market, and also Korea. Uh, so I think you need to be able to, through your own education programs, but also your interaction with industry, uh, continue to promote and work on the skills that will allow Australian tourism operators to still be world leaders. I'm constantly, um, I, shouldn't be say, I shouldn't say that I'm amazed, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm constantly reminded about the quality of the Australian tourism op operator whenever I go overseas. And, and what I mean by that is I always find Australians overseas. There's always Australians running hotels in major cities. There's always Australians running kitchens, running concierge services. Uh, there is a, a welcoming demeanour to our way of life that people find incredibly warm and hospitable. That is a strong service uh, and is something that's in strong demand right across the globe. So. We want to make sure that we don't lose that here at home, that we continue to work on the strength and growth of our own markets. And to that end, I've also um, gone to the very bottom or very of the value chain, so to speak, and partnered with Australian hotels uh, associations to create something as simple as a careers workshop uh, for school students to understand the opportunities that are available uh, across the hospitality and tourism sectors. I know that a lot of your institutions will take place in the regular careers markets that happen right across schools at, uh, during the various recruiting periods of each year, but I think it's fundamental that as key participants in the tourism sector that we continue to talk up the virtues of a career in tourism. And I think that's the important word, career. So often uh, we think of tourism operators or tourism employees as transient workers uh, on a casual basis who are not in permanent employment. But the capacity to see through those early casual days and move further up the uh, employment chain uh, into middle management positions and senior management positions really does provide a genuine career path. And I think as an industry, uh, we need to challenge ourselves to continually sell uh, the positive benefits of a long-term career in, in tourism. I've mentioned right at the beginning just the economic value of what tourism means to New South Wales and across the country, but that product can only continue to be strong if the quality of people working in it is as strong as what it's been in the past and continues to be strong into the future. I would also say that I think that there's uh, an important opportunity here in New South Wales, but also I would argue probably across the rest of the country, uh, that we need to be expanding our offerings in tourism beyond cities. It's important that we continue to offer unique opportunities and unique products for people to access. And regional New South Wales and regional Australia provides a really unique blend of experiences uh, that can't really be found anywhere else across the globe. And so we need to continue to work with, with regional operators, making sure they've got the support, they've got access to marketing budgets, and they've got access to resources that allow them to continue to promote their product to both domestic, but particularly to international operators. One of the most important sort of anecdotal conversations I had was with the CEO of Sea Trip in Shanghai. And he was telling me that what he's seeing across his business is a second generation of, of tourists. Uh, that second generation of tourists who are now a little bit wealthier, uh, they've been to Australia before, they've done the harbour, they've done the opera house, they've done the harbour bridge, and now they want to be able to access uh, a, a deeper experience. They want to be able to have a, a stronger understanding of you know, what is the cultural uh, underpinnings of Australia. What is the Indigenous culture and how has it contributed to Australian way of life? What is happening across regional New South Wales or the outback? Uh, how do we access things like safari opportunities at Western Plains Zoo? Um, those are the types of product offerings that I think are going to be particularly important. And from a tourism minister who has quite an ambitious target to double overnight visitor expenditure over a decade, I know that I can only achieve that if I have a diversity of product offerings and regional New South Wales and the regional Australian uh, product offering is fundamentally crucial to our long-term capacity to meet that target. Along with our need and desire to continue to open up opportunities for aviation partnerships so people can actually get here. And the third part of, uh, of the wheel uh, that will underpin growth out of all of your um, growth markets that you'll talk about over the next few days is our capacity to continue to open up new and diversified hotel stock. I do get concerned from time to time that we are a little bit cookie cutter in our hotel offering, particularly in Sydney. Uh, we have a lot of um, what we might describe as four 
to four and a half star product where the price points are very similar. Um, and that diverse, lack of diversity, I think, is a risk for us. So the capacity to bring on new hotel developments, and we are seeing a lot of interest in the development market around hotels over the last particularly 12 months. And that's an important thing for us to continue to blend uh, that diversity into our hotel stock and continue to open up uh, the number of room nights available in Sydney so that we can absorb that strong market demand that's coming out of Asia uh, and also uh, out of places like Germany and Europe. Um, I know that you're very focused on uh, emerging trends, but I would also remind you that as we look to those new opportunities, not to forget that there are some really strong staples that exist across the tourism sector. The United States and New Zealand still continue to be the number two and number three source markets for international tourists into New South Wales, and I think they will be in the top five for a considerable period of time. So for all of the work that we do in in opening up new source markets. It's important that we still blend our strong staple tourism uh, providers and tourists that are coming into the country uh, with new and important product offerings. And this, I think, uh, is the real challenge for us right across uh, the tourism sector on top of those areas around aviation, hotel development and the regional offerings. And that's to continue to renovate and refresh our product, uh, whether it's an aquarium, whether it's a hotel room, uh, whether it's a restaurant. Tourists will always want to do whatever the new and funky thing is. Uh, they don't want to come back and do what they've done before. And so the, the continual reinvention of our tourism stock, the, the continuing offer, offering of new product and new experiences is going to underpin the long-term growth, particularly when you blend that with the new and emerging markets that are stretched from India to China and some of those new markets that are emerging out of Europe. Good luck over the next couple of days. I'm sure that there's uh, plenty of good discussions. I look forward to reading some of the papers that have been presented. Uh, I think I'm the luckiest person in the New South Wales government. I've got the best job. I don't intend to, uh, to trade it up for anything, particularly given I got to work on police last year. It's, uh, it's good that we're able to wake up every single day with a smile on my face knowing that something exciting is happening in a really dynamic industry, not just across New South Wales, but right across the globe. Have a good couple of days and thank you for coming to Sydney.